You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. As well, there are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in London, who are the sole uh, publishers of Steiner into English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of a collected works, volume number 313 by Rudolf Steiner, entitled Illness and Therapy, Spiritual Scientific Aspects of Healing, the second medical course given by Steiner to doctors. This is Lecture 5, given in Dornach on the 15th of April, 1921. These observations will culminate in a description of the nature of the medicines we have assembled and which should then be brought into wider circulation. However, we will not be able to speak properly about the knowledge and skill necessary for using these medicines without the full preparation that is still required. Today, therefore, we will consider several aspects that can lead us into the whole fabric of the human being as this develops and emerges through the interplay of I, astral body, etheric body, and physical body. I have mentioned already that through a particular action of arsenic it is possible to induce the astral body to enter further into the organs than is otherwise the case in a particular patient and that this astral body of course draws the eye into or with it. Now drawing the astral body more into the organs increases their mineralizing process. And therefore we can also say that where we notice the organs as such are too strongly vitalized, are developing excessive life forces, and in a sense proliferating etherically, then we can heal this condition by administering arsenic. If we wish to, we can also even describe what happens inwardly in such a condition in terms of an external process which has what we might call an elective affinity with the process in the human being. To express this affinity of the astral body with the etheric body and via the latter with the physical body, we could certainly coin the term arsenize. A mild arsenizing process continually takes place in us and is present in most pronounced form at the moment we wake up. We must be clear that the human organism certainly has the quality of the metal in it as a system of forces. This elective affinity certainly exists between the human being and the surrounding earth and cosmos. Certain processes occur in us that occur outside us too and, for example, come to conclusion and rest in the metals. When we speak of an arsenization process in us, therefore, we should not imagine that arsenic itself is directly active there, but rather that our inner activity works in the same way as arsenic does in the external world. And thus we can gain insight into how we must aid and support such activity within us. If, therefore, you consider this arsenizing, which one might also call astralizing of the human organism, you will be able to discover that when this activity is too strong, it can manifest in a rise in temperature in the stomach region and even in a certain ease of digestion and assimilation. But this can, in fact, be cause for concern if it becomes too easy since all such easing within us is followed in turn by reactions and greater problems. All this is connected with a certain mineralization within us. It is possible to investigate and confirm this, though it must be done in the right way. That is, by taking all other factors into account as well. For instance, corpses of people who strongly astralize and in whose organic, physical processes arsenization is therefore at work, will decay less easily than those in whom the astral body is too weakly connected with the organs. This is certainly something we should take note of. 
in extreme form, we can see it in the tendency to mummification of corpses, poisoned by arsenic. They mummify and show strong resistance to the process of decay. Now we must ask how we can counter an excessive arsenizing or astralizing process in a person when, if you like, he is becoming mummified while still alive. It is necessary to connect an observation, a way of looking, with such a condition. If someone is becoming too strongly mummified, what can we do to counter this? To put it radically, we temporarily turn him into a tooth. This will help us trace some of the mysterious workings of the human organism. We make the whole human being into a tooth. In other words, taking the whole organism into account, we try, in some way, to administer to him the radiant power of magnesium, magnesium in some medicinal form. The radiant power of magnesium described by Professor Römer is then invoked through the whole organism. And this points us really very clearly toward a relationship which exists between the astral body, including and encompassing the I within it, on the one hand, and the etheric body and physical body on the other. Now let us try to look at the opposite picture, a condition where the astral body with the eye tends to penetrate the organs too little, and in which, therefore, the organs start to be left to their own devices, insofar as they are provided for by physical and etheric activity. This is a condition which manifests when there is no proper reciprocity of nutrition in the mutual interaction between our surroundings and our inner organic processes. The inner organic processes start energetically developing their own vital energy and cease to be receptive to outside influence. The powers of the eye no longer penetrate food substances so thoroughly and in consequence the astral body is also engaged one-sidedly and cannot gain proper access to the etheric body. What I would call a proliferation of physical and etheric activity occurs, initially manifesting as diarrhea and concomitant signs such as blood in the stool. Inner vital activity can become so strong that small pieces of organic tissue separate from the intestinal walls and are excreted in the stool. The stool itself may even become a serum-type fluid, a strong indication that vital energy within is proliferating without hindrance from the astralizing forces. Such things occur. Finally, even protein is carried along by this process and excreted without being properly assimilated. Conditions of this nature ultimately point to a failure of astral body and eye to work into our physical and etheric levels as they must, to accomplish these semi-conscious motions necessary for the human organism. Picture this now. The astral body and eye are not engaged here in the right way, and thus the etheric body and physical forces are left to their own devices, giving rise to tenismus, which is characteristic of such conditions. Readers aside, tenismus is spelled T-E-N-E-S-M-U-S. End of readers aside. The more this state of affairs pertains, the more that normal conditions of diarrhea progress to dysentery and beyond. And thus the further you proceed in describing this pathology the more you will see that it must be described in a way that invokes the picture opposite to that of arsenizing or astralizing processes. Everywhere you will find the counter-image of astralization or arsenization. And since the astral body is strongly involved here, you will be led more or less naturally to the conclusion that the medicine needed to combat this disorder derives from arsenic. That, in other words, 
arsenization is required to counteract such conditions. I believe that it can enormously enrich and intensify our ideas here if we realize that basically everything that occurs within us finds its correspondence in processes outside us in the surrounding world. And even if such things evidently sound repugnant to someone who has undergone conventional training, I will not refrain from using certain expressions, as long as we understand them in the right way, that have real meaning for spiritual science and can thoroughly ground us in these realities. When what we can observe in the human being as the process of arsenizing, astralizing, or if you like, the way the physical organism becomes brittle or mummified, is basically exactly the same process as occurs in rock formation. Wherever the earth forms rocks, it is in a sense poisoned or beginning to be poisoned by arsenic. By contrast, imagine that the external astrality which surrounds the earth everywhere, as I pointed out in the last lecture course, in a sense bypasses the earth's surface, bypasses this external astrality's task of bringing forth blossoms and drawing plants from the soil to the sphere above ground, and succeeds in penetrating below the earth's surface. Imagine that it bypasses the earth and adheres to water, and then in such regions the earth gets dysentery. When the external cosmic astrality works or is able to work on groundwater, the earth gets dysentery. This process I am describing is one based on reality, underpinned by many real factors, and we should attend to it carefully, for it can give us insight into the connection between what happens below the earth's surface and disorders such as dysentery. We can often discern in such things a kind of sub-earthly effect from the watery realm on the human being. The important thing here will be to take account of the astral body's strong involvement and to realize in consequence that we will need to use medium doses, medium potencies in bringing about a cure. This is because the astral body's action is, after all, dependent on the middle realm of the human organism. Now, diphtheria-type symptoms are especially able to give us what we might call intimate insights into the human organism. And these symptoms, manifesting as diphtheria-type conditions, should be studied more carefully in relation to the search for methods of healing. There is still a view today, I believe, rising from a more materialistic outlook, that diphtheria should, be, should, if possible, be treated locally, that this condition should be tackled at the local site where it manifests. Naturally, numerous other views also dispute this. The important thing about the development of diphtheria and everything related to it requires further elaboration here, since in the last course, we were not yet able to fully examine this reciprocal action between the four levels of the human organism described by spiritual science. In a different context, I suggested that the child's acquisition of speech is accompanied by many kinds of organic processes. The child learns to talk, and while he does so, and while therefore something particular occurs in his respiratory organism, something of a polar opposite nature at the same time occurs in his circulatory organism, the latter, of course, integrating metabolic processes into itself. Now, in a quite different context, I pointed out that the reciprocal relationship with our surroundings that appears at puberty unfolds inwardly when the child is learning to speak and that, in other words, what occurs when the astral body pushes outward from within at puberty occurs from below upward in the astralizing process. 
Learning to talk is, after all, a capacity that develops from below upward. Thus an astralizing process is involved there too. And we will see clearly how if we draw the boundary of the respiratory system and circulatory system here, see figure 10, a mutual interrelationship occurs between what rises as astralizing process from below upward and the organs that come to meet this astralization from above and intensify their capacity for speech. Our particular interest must focus on what occurs simultaneously here below, for this process down here has the urge to ascend. The whole process is one that rises from below upward. The whole thing has the urge to rise upward. If the process that rises from below upward spreads out too far in an upward direction, and if therefore too strong an upward push of astrality occurs as children learn to talk, this upsurge of astrality represents a disposition to develop diphtheria-type conditions. This is what gives rise to conditions of diphtheria. It is certainly important to give due attention to this. Now, let us also consider the external earth process, which has a certain affinity with the process I just described. Let us assume that this is the earth's surface here, see figure 11. In a plant, which you can say behaves properly toward the cosmos, the earth participates in the formation of its roots, and this earth influence then diminishes so that the extraterrestrial influences grow ever stronger, unfolding particularly in the flower. What unfolds here in the flower is in fact a kind of external astralizing of the flower, which then leads to the development of fruit. If what ought to occur in the normal course of cosmic processes does occur down here, see figure 11, it can only engage with water and we then have what I call the dysentery of the earth. However, what happens when, as I said, the plant develops properly into a decent plant, always a little way above the surface of the soil where the flower unfolds, can also develop right at the surface of the soil itself. And then we get mushrooms and fungi. That's how mushrooms grow. You will likely be close to saying now that if mushrooms and fungi develop through this kind of idiosyncratic astralization, then the same process, and this is indeed the case, must occur from below upward toward the head as in diphtheria, when this singular astralization process takes place within us. And this is why the tendency to a fungal condition exists in diphtheria. We must be very much aware of this fungal tendency and take full account of it. A really very hidden process occurs here. All its external aspects are in fact only a sign that irregular astral streams prevail within a person. And this can show us that a school of pathology, which concerns itself merely with outer symptoms, can of course only gain access to an external manifestation of the whole process. Diphtheria is regarded as a local disorder because only the external symptoms are recognized without attention to what pushes its way out from within in such a condition. The very skeptical stance people have toward this process can easily be explained if we go back to consider the things that have just been described. The risk of infection is actually great in diphtheria-related disorders. But why? It is because they develop in direct connection with learning to speak and occur, therefore, most widely in children aged between two and four. After this age, children are less susceptible. But every process in the human organism that arises in the normal course of things at any particular period can also arise abnormally. This process, therefore, that is really simply a natural process of childhood development, can also occur at a later age, albeit 
in a somewhat modified form, a metamorphosis. When diphtheria occurs at a later age, this is in a sense an infantile condition that works on in a person. And the fundamental nature of infancy, as you know, in mundane accounts of spiritual scientific facts, we usually need to speak in more psychological terms, is imitation. I'm going to read that sentence again. And the fundamental nature of infancy, as you know, in mundane accounts of spiritual scientific facts, we usually need to speak in more psychological terms, is imitation. From an external viewpoint, childhood and infancy certainly involve a process of imitation, and imitation is sought. The organism itself is induced to become imitative when it contracts diphtheria. This is why infection is caused, really, by an urge to become imitative. And such imitation is informed by a subtle sensibility, which we can certainly observe If we study the matter through spiritual science, we find that the eye does, in fact, play a certain role in the process of diphtheria infection. And, therefore, what develops as fungal infection, the parasitic nature of diphtheria, is more infectious in this condition than in other diseases, because the human organism comes to meet it with its imitative urge. As soon as this organism to put it in a rough and ready way, perceives the diphtheria toxin anywhere, it makes itself receptive to it, relates to it imitatively. For this reason, at an initial stage of the disease, addressing the psyche, strengthening a person through psychological encouragement will always have a beneficial effect. With such processes, however, that act so strongly on the organism, we will naturally achieve much less by these means than if we try to discover what I will call the specific antidote to the process occurring there. Here, at least, I am unaware whether people have made any efforts, even empirically, to discover an antidote to diphtheria-related disorders. One should look for it, for example, in cinnabar up to a medium potency. Cinnabar is the substance whose effects will counteract all the kinds of disorder I have been speaking of. In its very appearance, cinnabar expresses this counteractive capacity. However, an outward appearance only tells us something if we observe it with inner vision. The old doctrine of signatures, which has vanished today simply because people no longer have the necessary powers of observation, relied on instinctive inner vision. It is important, however, to be able to perceive the inner activity which, basically, is apparent in all external appearances in the world. Someone, therefore, who does not get stuck in a mystic realm, veiling things and all sorts of mystification, but instead retains his healthy common sense, will have to say that vermilion, red cinnabar, is something that in a sense expresses an activity that counteracts fungal processes. Whatever tends toward a colorless state can become fungal. Whereas too strong an astralization of the Earth's surface is implicated in fungal growth, in cinnabar-related substances we find a reactivity to this astralization, a counteraction and therefore the red color. Wherever reddishness appears in natural processes, astralization is strongly counteracted. To couch this in moral terms, one could say that by reddening the rose, excuse me, that by reddening, the rose tries to defend itself against astralization. Such realms, therefore, involve an interrelated view of pathology and therapy that can lead us into this remarkable relationship of I and astral body to the other organs, in which they grasp hold of organs or withdraw from them, or manifest excess astral activity in streams rising from below upward. 
In this way we can gradually come to insight into the whole human body. We can penetrate and understand it if we pass from such considerations to something else. And here you will have to consider in turn things I presented last year, but which I will now add to and extend. It is very remarkable that the human eye, if we now regard its spiritual, psychological, organic, and also mineralizing action in the human being, is a kind of phosphorus bearer. The eye elaborates its business of phosphorus bearing by pursuing this activity to the periphery of the human being. To bear phosphorus through the human organism permeating us with phosphorus is an I activity. The I carries out this phosphorus bearing to the outermost limits and periphery of the human organism in an extraordinarily skillful way. Up to a certain limit, which it is necessary to adhere to, the I can in fact only bear phosphorus through the organism by attaching it to other substances and forming chemical compounds with them. In bearing phosphorus through the organism, the eye, basically, prevents the chemical release of phosphorus. Preventing the chemical release of phosphorus is one of the tasks of the eye, except for traces of phosphorus that are in fact necessary if what ought to be instigated were instigated to a greater degree. If the eye proved unable to stop phosphorus, introduced into the organism from being released. If the phosphorus in us were released, causing an intense effect on the human organism, a very distinct process would be unleashed. During these lectures I said that when we are born, thus embodying physically what previously existed as soul and spirit, Images of the etheric body, the astral body, and the eye are first engendered. And I said that everything that is an image of the eye really lies in dynamic systems, movement systems that come into balance. Now this is something we must be thoroughly aware of at this stage in our reflections. In developing states of balance from imbalance, from upset states of balance, and whenever I walk or stride, I disrupt my balance and have to re-establish it, and the same thing also occurs through inner processes, the I needs phosphorus to work in this way. This work is largely carried out through phosphorus. If the I does not work in such a way as to exhaust its phosphorizing activity in making human dynamics static, then with phosphorus it approaches what is already an intrinsic image of the eye, bringing dynamic movement to stasis in this way. I have spoken of how we need to consider the human being as an aqueous, gaseous, and warmth being. Imagine now that you are concerned with the fluid human being and with what enters into the etheric body from the reflected image of the eye and the astral body, in which the eye is in turn imprinted. Here you can see that in this etheric body too it is necessary for a dynamic element, a lack of equilibrium to continually pass over into balance. The effects we are considering here are really very subtle. And these subtle effects are regulated by virtue of the fact that the human body contains what you might call little free-floating globules or spherules that are, however, in turn connected with the organism's whole movement, also its inner motion. These are the blood globules. What the eye does must impact on these globules as it plays into our mobility, also, for example, into the inner mobility of warmth. These blood globules or corpuscles are thus not globules, but are such that their very form reveals how they are geared to leading movements into balance. It's like this. 
What the eye does when it engages with the human organism's movement capacity meets a boundary in the blood globules and must be halted there. The most intimate reciprocal action must occur there between the human eye and the whole human organism. And now what I would call a deeply concealed battle takes place between the ongoing phosphorization of a human being and what lies in the configuring blood process. You see, if phosphorus is taken into the organism in its free state, the blood corpuscles are destroyed by this phosphorizing process. This can lead us to a picture of the remarkable reciprocal action of the eye which is spiritual in nature, spiritual through and through, but which, through the blood corpuscles, is in continual mutual interaction with the physical aspect. In this respect, blood is also a very special fluid, an old saying that can be traced back to before Goethe's time. Blood is indeed a very special fluid, for it is where the human being's external physical nature enters into reciprocal interplay with the most spiritual aspect we initially bear within us, the I. And when the I enters into this mutual interplay in the wrong way, it is here too that the most ruinous effects can become apparent. If this mutual interplay occurs in the wrong way, a great deal can be destroyed at the physical level, so that we see epithelial disintegration, fatty degeneration of tissue right into muscle fibers, especially striated muscle fibers, since these are where the eye is particularly active, and dissolution of the blood corpuscles, etc. This process of disintegration can even make its way right into the bones if there is a disorder of phosphorus processes. This is clearly apparent in this reciprocal action between the eye, which of course involves the astral body too, and the physical body, which draws the etheric body after it. It is very apparent how a continual search for both normality and abnormality occurs. For a normalization advancing to a certain culmination, and how an ebbing that occurs and how this manifests if, for example, we meet a condition of phosphorus poisoning. In phosphorus poisoning, we can observe that initially both the astral body and the etheric body resist what asserts itself both in the physical body and in the eye. They resist it with all their power, with the strongest energy the etheric body can muster. The latter tries to make headway against what develops as excessive influence in the eye, tries to make headway against it and strengthens its own forces. This is why at the first stage of phosphorus poisoning the process so closely resembles another in which after death we experience a panoramic review of our life. As you know this can last for several days, a day and a half, two days or three. In this review The etheric body is held within the astral body and we can say that they adhere to each other. They also do this initially in the human body when phosphorus poisoning occurs. Everything is developed that can be developed through the collaborative action of astral body and etheric body and which then likewise occurs in the etheric body's panoramic view, excuse me, review after death. In the first stages of phosphorus poisoning, therefore, this expended energy will lead to an improvement in the same length of time that such a review would last, followed by a flagging and ebbing of strength. Then after this ebbing of strength, the abnormal action of the eye reasserts itself even more strongly. It is really extraordinarily difficult to combat a real case of phosphorus poisoning. This could only be attempted through vigorous efforts to induce strong collaboration between the astral and etheric, which might be achieved, for instance, by application of powerful blistering plasters to various places on the body. 
this would no doubt have a beneficial effect. In such a case we have to be clear how far we must go and develop a feeling for this. So you see that the physical organism, when the I acts within it, is most strongly engaged by all that one can call the phosphorizing process within us. But when the I intervenes strongly in the physical organism, and thus in a destructive way, the polar opposite must also inevitably occur. And then there is likewise a deficiency of what the I would normally initiate by not taking too strong a hold. In conditions of excessive phosphorus activity, therefore, you will have states of sleeplessness, which are simply due to the fact that astral body and I are working their way in and grasping hold too strongly. You can gather from this you can gather this from all that I have said. There will be headaches, delirious states, and narcolepsy. In phosphorus poisoning, these and also prior to general paralysis, anemic conditions all naturally occur in consequence of what I have described as the reciprocal action between the eye and the blood. And then as a middle ground of these factors, and occurring therefore when the pendulum of the process swings back, as it were, from what we can call an attack on the blood corpuscles by the eye, jaundice-type symptoms appear. And in conditions of jaundice, we must certainly see an interplay between psychological and physical factors. From what I have said here, you will see that the process at work in a human being largely involves the eye and the astral body working with the forces of the external world within the space encompassed by our skin. They work inward upon us, and we have to be able to properly discern how their penetration can be regulated, how, in a sense, we can develop a kind of mastery over this penetrating, infiltrating activity. On a fairly mundane level, based on this view, certain dietary rules emerge by themselves if we know that the excessive action of the eye results in irregularities in the stomach, but at the same time in over-vitalization, manifesting as abnormal diarrhea and such like. It is necessary, of course, to combat such conditions through diet. The intrinsic eye process and that of the astral body within us embody a kind of analyzing activity, a breaking down and sundering of what is present as a whole in the outer world. While we have what I would call a primary synthesizing process in the physical and etheric substrata of the human organism, we have analyzing processes in the activity of eye and astral body. And this analyzing activity certainly belongs to the normal processes within us and comes to such strong, idiosyncratic expression that at an appropriate point this analyzing process must also come to a stop. If the eye becomes too strong an analyzer in relation to phosphates, it analyzes them as far as phosphorus type activity and then the analysis starts to cause havoc in the human organism. The point where analysis may legitimately act most strongly is, as I showed in last year's lectures, where the analyzing process carries through into iron. This analyzing into iron is connected with the blood's iron levels and is in many respects the polar opposite of the analyzing process for other metals, which must always, in a sense, be brought to a halt. Today, therefore, I, I wanted to show you how outer phenomena actually provide us with pictures of what emerges from an inner spiritual realm. An external view of states of health and sickness must be augmented by what we can also know about the inner spiritual reality within the human being. On this basis we can gain insights into our medicines and also develop the right basis for answering various questions that have been posed. As far as this is possible, we will discuss all this in the three lectures that still remain. The end of Lecture 5